January 20th, 1981. On this day, Ronald Reagan replaced Jimmy Carter as President of the United States. I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best Carter had come to office determined to, to curb the excesses ability. of the CIA and other U.S. intelligence agencies. Reagan believed the result had crippled America's espionage capabilities. Yet both of their intelligence policies failed them. Iran would play the pivotal role in those failures. Carter's attempts to rescue American diplomatic hostages ended in tragedy in the Iranian desert and doomed his hopes of re-election. The rescue attempt also led to the formation of a highly secret Pentagon anti-terrorist unit, the Special Operations Division. As we shall see, from this unit sprang the idea of the Enterprise, an unaccountable group of secret warriors created by the Reagan White House to conduct covert operations first in Central America and then throughout the world. An existing off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, stand-alone entity that could perform certain activities on behalf of the United States. From the zealous men who ran the secret enterprise would come the controversial affair now known as Iran-Contra, a government crisis not only of men, but of the Constitution itself. In this, the final hour of our series, we'll see the disturbing consequences of what happens when the pendulum of U.S. espionage swings from one extreme to another. America's new president, himself a former CIA director, We'll have to determine just what role America's secret world of intelligence will play in pursuing his policies. What he decides may very well determine the outcome of his presidency. In January 1979, after months of rioting, the Shah of Iran was overthrown. Ayatollah Khomeini seized power in the name of Islam. The United States was vilified as the great Satan. Soon after, the U.S. Embassy was seized. There were open lines to Tehran, and we had these disembodied voices from the other side of the world coming through to us describing a really terrible situation. There were uh, militants beating on the door outside their... Uh, the vault that they had uh, they had withdrawn to, uh, there was uh, things were getting very hot. They were burning uh, paper inside, trying to destroy classified documents. And what they couldn't tell, and one never can tell, I'd been in a vault like that once, uh, uh, was whether the heat was coming from inside or whether, in fact, the embassy was on fire. So they didn't know at all what their status was, and they were frightened. Uh, I mean, they were they feared for their lives, and they had good reason to fear for their lives. As Iranian militants stormed the embassy, American hostages were taken. They would be held captive 444 agonizing days. These events took the United States and its intelligence agencies by surprise. Only six months earlier, the CIA had reported to Carter that Iran is not in a revolutionary or even pre-revolutionary situation. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. The Iranian Revolution was a major intelligence failure on the part of the United States. 
The knowledge that there was trouble in Iran was uh, universal. Uh, nobody had any doubt that uh, the Shah was in trouble, that his regime was facing a challenge. Uh, there were, after all, riots in the streets every 40 days that could hardly be overlooked. The question was not whether there is trouble in Iran. The question in making policy was how far is it going to go? What is the outcome of this going to be? And so it involved a determination about whether the Shah could realistically expect to survive that challenge or whether he was going to go under. And that was where the failure came in, was in estimating what the effects of this were, how deep it went, and what it was likely to do as far as policy was concerned. Iran was America's worst intelligence failure since Pearl Harbor. But how had this breakdown of analysis happened? Blind support of the Shah was one reason. The intelligence policies of Carter was another. He won the presidency as an outsider, a leader untarnished by Vietnam, Watergate, and the excesses of the CIA. At CIA headquarters, he announced his intention to reform the agency. I'll do all I can, working with past directors who are here, and the Secretary of Defense who is here, and the Attorney General who's here, and other leaders who are here, to let the American people have an accurate assessment and the deepest possible commitment that every action of the intelligence community now and in the future will be legal and proper. Carter was determined to minimize secret actions by secret agents, to replace humans wherever possible with spy machines. There were many to choose from. New and dazzling ones like the KH-11 satellite, and all reliables, among them the high-flying U-2 and the world's fastest airplane, the SR-71. The eagerness to exploit this technology was shared by Carter's CIA director, Admiral Stansfield Turner. It was clear to people in American intelligence that the technical systems for collecting data had overwhelmed the old spy systems. That meant that all of us running intelligence turned in different directions. And this had happened long before my time, but we were just beginning to really appreciate that the revolution had happened when I got there. We turned in different directions when we had a problem, when we had a crisis. Our instinct was to go for one of these technical systems and say, I want some information right now about what's happening. But many CIA officers resented Turner and his emphasis on machines and resigned. Robert Simmons was one of them. I think that when uh, the Carter administration came into power, they had a deep distrust of the intelligence community, in particular, uh, a distrust of the clandestine service. They weren't comfortable with dealing with people who led secret lives. But human source collection, talking to somebody in a foreign country, debriefing a defector, uh, talking to prisoners of war. These are vital elements uh, of the whole intelligence picture. And I felt that the Carter administration in particular uh, and Admiral Turner were focusing much more on the technical aspects of intelligence collection and much less on human source collection. And so I quit in disgust. Uh, I was frustrated by the situation that I was faced with, and I think many of my colleagues were frustrated as well. Those worries about over-reliance on technology were shared by Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski. The American intelligence is about the best in the world when it comes to the scientific, technical dimensions of intelligence. But it's certainly not up to par when it comes to making sound political judgments, when it comes to cultivating and nourishing important political relationships that yield intelligence. What are you going to do? Uh, Turner quickly learned the limitations of technology when he was unable to produce information requested by the president. Well, there was a small war in a remote country pair of remote countries and the president I think more as an experiment than anything because he was new and I was new said 
He'd like to see some pictures of what was going on. And I told the satellite people, quick, get us some pictures for the president. I was embarrassed day after day, week after week, when we did not have any. Uh, it turned out that the instructions to the satellite people uh, were misinterpreted. I was uh, several weeks before I finally got some pictures for the president. Very embarrassing. But it was typical of the problem we had. We were just really coming into this whole new age and learning to give the right instructions, learning to use these devices to best advantage. But pictures, even when in hand, cannot divine thoughts and intentions. This, the United States would learn in Iran, a place teeming with U.S. listening devices for eavesdropping on the nearby Soviet Union, but a country where the CIA had virtually no human assets, no one who was probing inside the minds of the Iranian people. The Shah reigned because of U.S. support, but behind the pageantry lay political repression, even torture, carried out by Iran's CIA-trained secret police, Savak. This fact, U.S. presidents from Eisenhower to Carter overlooked. Yet, despite America's unwavering support, Iran's ruler was deeply suspicious of the nation that had brought him to power. In 1953, the United States had conspired to put the Shah back on the throne uh, when he was under uh, challenge in what has been referred to as a counter coup, a covert action. That stuck, of course, in the Shah's mind, and he was constantly aware after that and feared that the United States could do the reverse, that if we disagreed with him, we could uh, take him off the throne as well. And so he wanted to do as much as possible to keep us out of his domestic activities. And I think he succeeded uh, very well in, in, in getting us out of those activities. We quit looking uh, at the opposition uh, in Iran, and in effect, ended up being very badly prepared for what came along. The White House was badly prepared in another way. With few political resources inside Iran, there were even fewer options for rescuing the American hostages. Carter, who had come to office wary of covert operations, found himself turning more and more to America's secret warriors for solutions. We spent a great deal of time agonizing over what kind of a charter ought to be promulgated under which the intelligence activities would be conducted. I think subsequently, but not too long thereafter, the president started approving quite a few covert activities. In desperation, Carter approved a military mission to free the American hostages. U.S. helicopters loaded with Delta commandos flew through the night of April 24th, 1980 to a rendezvous spot codenamed Desert One. There, they met disaster. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages. As our team was withdrawing after my order to do so, two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. To my deep regret, eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. The wreckage in the Iranian desert became a symbol of Carter's inability to respond to world events. It was also a humiliation for the Pentagon Special Forces, which resolved never to be caught in such a failure again. The new American president agreed. 
Ronald Reagan promised a new era, a time when America would reassert its world leadership and aggressively fight terrorism and communism. Oh, I am. Did you place your left hand on the Bay of Bible and raise your right hand? It was a position that came naturally to this veteran of the Cold War. During the Red Scare, Reagan was president of the Screen Actors Guild in Hollywood. That uh, small clique uh, has been referred to, has been discussed as more or less following the tactics that we uh, associate with the Communist Party. Motivated by his concern that communists were infiltrating the movie industry, Reagan became a secret informant for the FBI. His code name was T-10. He also solicited contributions for Crusade for Freedom, the Radio Free Europe and Asia campaign, actually backed by the CIA. Stop the spread of communism in the Far East. The Crusade for Freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City. Or join in your local community. In 1981, the presidency of the United States provided Reagan with a powerful platform for his fervent anti-communism. Those activist views were shared by his campaign manager, William Casey, who Reagan appointed CIA director with cabinet rank. Never before had a president and his CIA director enjoyed such a close personal relationship. Well, two things are important. It's important that the president have confidence in the, his intelligence chief. And uh, it's important that he can, they can talk to each other when they need to. It's uh, important that the intelligence chief know uh, oh, he's in a position to judge the president's uh, interests and his evaluations and uh, see that he gets the information he needs and that he has it properly presented. Casey wanted to be the Secretary of State, and uh, he was not going to get that because he couldn't speak that well because he was not the kind of uh, articulate spokesman that Ronald and Nancy Reagan thought Alexander Haig would be. So Casey had to get something. Uh, CIA was ideal. He was the intellectual godfather, if you will, of the idea of we are not going to get pushed around in this world anymore. We're going to get the upper hand. And he set a tone of there are no limits. Casey had learned the trade craft of intelligence in World War II as a young OSS officer fighting against Nazi Germany. He brought that same sense of mission to the CIA, often willing to rush in where others feared to go. I became a little bit disenchanted because it seemed to me that Casey was living in the past and that he was trying to recreate the atmosphere and the operational tactics which OSS had been using against the Germans in 1944 and 1945. And I felt simply that the times were different, the conditions were different, the requirements were different, and it didn't seem to me that Casey was facing up to the requirements of the 80s. Just days after his swearing-in, Casey authorized money and arms to battle Libya's Muammar Gaddafi in Chad. That was followed by clandestine support of anti-communist guerrillas in Cambodia. In Soviet-occupied Afghanistan, he increased CIA support for the Mujahideen. He also supported the funding of a new spy satellite system that would be able to see through clouds and in the dark. But Casey's main agenda was dominated by the growing communist movement in Central America and terrorist attacks in the Middle East. We have to show strength and be prepared to act with strength when it's necessary, when, you're, when your, your reputation and your uh, national security requires it. When you protect your, you need to require to protect your citizens, as is perhaps on occasion in the, against a terrorist threat today. Threat would become nightmare for Casey when Islamic terrorists struck in Lebanon. This is a picture of the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, taken at the moment of explosion. The truck bomb attack in the fall of 1983 killed 241 Marines. 
not so many Americans had died since the Vietnam War. But the carnage, it turns out, could have been avoided. Months before, a U.S. military intelligence team was sent into Beirut to assess marine security measures. The team found serious flaws. Marine sentries without bullets in their rifles. Barriers removed for the convenience of supply trucks. Far worse, in an investigation launched after the event, the team learned that intelligence existed to indicate an impending attack but nothing was done. Now, retired Lieutenant Colonel William Cowan was a member of that team. The intelligence was there to indicate that a bombing was imminent. The U.S. Army Special Forces Group had a mobile training team working directly with Lebanese in East Beirut. Uh, they had been warned four or five days before the bombing by their Lebanese contacts that a bomb had been moved into the city in preparation for a bombing on the Marine compound. There's no question in my mind that there was intelligence there to support the Marines being ready. There's also no question that that word never got to the commander of the Marine forces. We suffered those casualties because the intelligence system did not work in Beirut. The bombing of the, of the Marine barracks in Beirut was one of those seminal events. Uh, for Casey or the Reagan administration. Not only was it a, an intelligence and military problem and a diplomatic problem, it was a political problem for Casey because he had said, we're going to turn the intelligence agencies around. We are not going to let anyone be tougher than we are. And in September 1984, there is a second bombing of the uh, embassy annex in Beirut. Now that is right before the 84 election. Uh, Casey went bananas. So did the Pentagon. After the attack on its U.S. Marine barracks, the Pentagon sent its intelligence team back into war-torn Beirut. Their mission? Develop a plan for U.S. retaliation. They roamed throughout this dangerous city gathering intelligence. The recommendations were first submitted to the CIA station chief. William Buckley. We briefed Bill Buckley, the chief of station in Beirut, who was later kidnapped, uh, brutally tortured, and ultimately died. We briefed our recommendations to him. He was ecstatic. Uh, he was, uh, I think Bill was pleased as he told us, uh, thank God somebody's finally looking at this thing and thinking about what we can do first. We went back to European command, briefed the recommendations there, very favorable reply, response, excuse me. And then we came back to the Pentagon, and as with our previous report, we submitted a report and put it into the bureaucracy. And it died. Just what type of retaliation Cowan's report recommended is classified. But his personal feelings echo back to solutions rejected in the past. We have a policy in this country of not assassinating people. Uh, somewhere along the line, though, uh, that policy maybe needs to be reviewed, not on a blanket basis. Certainly for sheer political reasons, we wouldn't want to do it. But when it comes time to speaking to the deaths of Americans, who we know are directly attributable to a small number of people, I don't think there are too many members of Congress who are going to yell loud and long about the fact that we might selectively want to pay back some people who have a deep hatred for the United States who would kill any one of us sitting here if they had the opportunity and I'm not sure I can justify nor should we justify why we can't uh, why we can't take some kind of action against those kinds of people on a selective basis but who would decide on a selective basis and in secret who should live and who should die such troubling questions led to a 1977 presidential order banning foreign political assassinations. The Soviet Union has no such restriction. The KGB's reaction to terrorism in the Middle East has been swift and ruthless. As in the 1984 case of four Soviet diplomats taken hostage in Beirut by the Islamic radical group Hezbollah. The Soviets decided to speak the language of the radical Hezbollah uh, in Beirut. 
they took a relative of one of the Hezbollah leaders, uh, cut off his testicles, put the testicles in his mouth, shot him, uh, sent him back. Very shortly after that, uh, the Soviet diplomats were released. The significance of this was that Casey uh, realized that the Soviets could be tough, could deal on exactly the same terms uh, that Hezbollah dealt, and they were victorious. So Casey decided in 1985, when we could not uh, stop the car bombings uh, of our embassy facilities and other facilities in Beirut, Casey decided to speak the language of Hezbollah and got the Saudi intelligence service to try to assassinate Sheikh Fadlallah, the leader of Hezbollah, and sent a car bomb uh, to the apartment complex where he lived, hoping to kill him, killed instead 80 innocent people. Uh, that was a pretty big shock to Casey. Uh, he did not have the CIA institutionally involved in this. He did it. He did a deal with the Saudi ambassador here, and then the Saudis funded the operation. The CIA adamantly denies any involvement in the 1985 bombing of Hezbollah headquarters. The repetition of this false allegation, the CIA wrote to us, perpetuates the lie and further endangers American lives at terrorists' hands overseas. Besides the bombings in Beirut, there were other setbacks for Casey in 1985, known as the Year of the Spy. Not since the Red Scare of the 50s had so many spies inside America been uncovered. This CIA officer, Larry Chin, spied for the Chinese. The National Security Agency's Ronald Pelton sold highly sensitive eavesdropping information to the Soviets. The Walker family spy ring sold naval secrets to the KGB for years. Edward Lee Howard, a former CIA officer, escaped to Moscow even while under FBI surveillance. Richard Miller, a counterintelligence specialist for the FBI, was not so lucky. Hidden cameras and microphones helped lead to his arrest. Gray links. It's a gray link. Since the days of J. Edgar Hoover, technology has played a major role in the FBI's counterintelligence activities. But high-tech spying has gone way beyond wiretaps. Today, virtually no conversation is safe from eavesdropping. Anyone who's ever seen a TV detective show knows to check the lamps for bugs. But listening devices have become far more sophisticated than this. On the other side of this wall, a small bug is listening to everything I say. Without penetrating the wall, or leaving a mark. It's a compact microphone which turns this room into a recording studio. But even if you find all the listening devices in this room or next door, you may not be safe. For several hundred feet away, in a motel room, someone is still listening. Using a beam of light, a laser, they have turned this window into a giant microphone. And they can hear everything that is said in this room. Distance and darkness are no longer obstacles to these tools of surveillance. Here, an infrared telescope sees in the night. But high technology combined with aggressive FBI agents pose a danger, the potential for abuse. That's always uh, an area you have to be sensitive to and a balance you have to strike. And, and our focus is on the intelligence officer. And I mentioned in general terms the numbers by saying that a good one-third of the, the Soviet Soviet bloc representatives are going to be intelligence officers. That's where our focus is. We attempt to create a net in which they have to operate that makes it extremely difficult. We can't, we don't have the resources or the inclination to try to focus on Americans. I mean, we can't be out surveilling uh, American citizens and members of the public. 
uh, our focus is on the intelligence officer, and that's where it's going to stay. But even as the head of the FBI's counterintelligence division was making this statement, the Bureau was surveilling American citizens. The focus of the investigation, which began in 1983, was CISPUS, Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, an activist, peace, and human rights group, which the FBI suspected of being controlled by communist foreign agents and of planning terrorist acts in the United States. This FBI investigation echoed back to abuses of the past when groups opposed to another war, Vietnam, were targeted by the Bureau. Stop, the protests against the war in Central America have been fewer in number than during Vietnam, but the FBI's response was the same. Open dissents with White House policy brought secret FBI investigations. In this investigation, they, con they used a variety of, of means to um, infiltrate the organization, put informers and agents into CISPUS, they surveilled meetings, they photographed demonstrators, um, took license plate numbers, made inquiries of banks and other institutions to find out about people, had um, FBI agents attempt to interview members of the organization. And then this, uh, this investigation expanded to include about 200 organizations ranging from the Mary Knoll Sisters to the United Auto Workers, which be it became a, an investigation almost of any anybody or any organization that was opposed to the Reagan administration policy in Central America. In the end, the FBI investigation produced 17 volumes of reports, but not a single indictment. This kind of FBI surveillance of Americans exercising their freedom of dissent is disturbing to Congressman Don Edwards, chairman of the House Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights and a former FBI agent. I think that the CISPUS uh, experience, which is very unfortunate and hurt the FBI, and also hurt a lot of innocent people, remember. A lot of names got bandied around, and CISPUS got hurt, damaged severely by things that the FBI did and said and published. Uh, I think it was an aberration, and I, and I hope it is. We usually find out uh, when they go too far, and CISPUS is an example of the FBI um, not examining what it's doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and perhaps uh, Congress ourselves not uh, maintaining a close enough oversight scrutiny on what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to shedding light on questionable FBI activities, the CISPUS investigation has added to the ongoing national debate over U.S. policies in Central America. America's secret war against communist Nicaragua began early in the Reagan administration when CIA Director Casey proposed the recruitment of 500 exiles to carry out guerrilla operations. The Contras quickly expanded to number in the thousands. People just couldn't take seriously this sort of threat that the Nicaraguan regime are someday going to be banging up against the borders of Texas. But this was just the point on which we uh, didn't agree. In fact, at one time, Casey offered me the position of being chief of Central American operations. And what did you say? I told him, thank you very much. I've had my Vietnam. Casey pushed ahead with his secret war, even though Congress had passed legislation known as the Boland Amendments, prohibiting CIA activities aimed at overthrowing the Nicaraguan government. In 1984, CIA teams mined Nicaragua harbors and attacked fuel facilities. This covert action deeply eroded trust between Casey and Capitol Hill, as witnessed by former CIA officer Robert Simmons, then a member of the Senate intelligence staff. I think people felt uh, that they uh, had been uh, screwed by the administration. In 1984, 
the uh, committees had not been notified properly uh, with regard to the mining of Nicaraguan harbors. Uh, and as a, res as a consequence of that, uh, Director Casey apologized to the committees. It would seem to me that, that uh, Director Casey and his staff and people at the White House would have learned from that experience. What Casey saw is that Congress provides the money, uh, all of these people who are unsophisticated Neanderthals about intelligence and in, in this need to spy and uh, the need to conduct operations. He looked at them and he said, uh, they're not in my league. And so he minimized disclosure, minimized contact. While Congress struggled to control Casey's CIA, another secret group operating out of the basement of the Pentagon escaped congressional scrutiny. Known as the Special Operations Division, or SOD, it was created as an anti-terrorist unit following the failed rescue mission in Iran. Much of what is known about SOD is because of the investigative work of this journalist, Stephen Emerson, who obtained thousands of pages of SOD secret documents through the Freedom of Information Act. The Special Operations Division became the new center for intelligence and counterterrorist activities in the Pentagon. In effect, it became a mini CIA for the Pentagon, established in the basement, controlling half a dozen new counterterrorism units, names such as Sea Spray, Quick Reaction Team, Yellow Fruit, Intelligence Support Activity, heavily classified. To this day, the Army does not acknowledge their existence, but all extremely capable, very aggressive in, the, in accomplishing their mission, the mission of fighting terrorism and guerrilla subversion around the world. These units were ready to go anywhere and do anything. The bugging of Noriega in Panama, KGB cars in West Germany, the tracking down of a kidnapped U.S. general held by the Red Brigade in Italy. They were all over the world, and uh, they felt they had a mandate to be all over the world. After all, the CIA was, was a shadow of what it used to be. And the Special Operations Division was literally stepping into a void. SOD may have been stepping into a void, but it was doing so with enormous resources. Tom Golden was in charge of financial control for a subunit of SOD called Yellow Fruit. The funding was almost unlimited. Uh, I don't know of any time that we were in a position where we needed money. Uh, the money was offered and we had to find ways to spend it, basically. In the fall of 1983, some units of the SOD participated in the U.S. invasion of Grenada. By then, the secret team's existence was known to National Security Council staffer Oliver North. It is believed that North, who worked closely with CIA Director Casey, quickly recognized how useful this super-secret group could be to the CIA in Central America. The SOD, located in the basement of the Pentagon, could be used to circumvent the legislative requirement that all covert operations be reported to Congress. Thus, the SOD could become a convenient vehicle to be used by the agency to conduct operations which it couldn't get approved, or in funding operations for which it had no money, like support for the Contras in Nicaragua. One of the most severe and scandalous projects ever embarked upon the U.S. military was a project called Yellow Fruit. It was a backdoor CIA effort to aid the Contras in Central America and to perform other operations that Congress never would have supported. And the CIA saw Yellow Fruit and the Special Operations Division as a magical fountain of support with unlimited money, unlimited weapons, Black money, black cap transportation capability. Basically, another CIA without any of the reporting, quote, problems that had triggered the problems of the late 1970s. Some of the units actually participated in strafing Nicaraguan targets, bombarding airfields and oil fields in an attempt to disrupt and possibly dislodge the Sandinista regime. 
But Tom Golden blew the whistle on Operation Yellowfruit. Uh, normally, in intelligence operations, you're advanced a certain amount of money to operate with. Uh, once you spend that money, uh, then you must submit a voucher to, uh, to account for it. What I found was very unusual in this unit is people had been advanced as much as uh, $150,000 and had never submitted a voucher for accountability. I eventually went to my superiors and reported what I believed to be abuse of funds and uh, possibly fraud. Uh, that eventually was, uh, was surfaced to the leadership of the Army, who ordered a massive investigation into the uh, special operations community in general. This is Arlington Hall, Virginia, headquarters for U.S. Army Intelligence. Here, members of the SOD team were court-martialed in a soundproof room. Two SOD members are now serving prison sentences for financial fraud. But what was most important about these trials was not the discovery of another case of misuse of government funds, but the revelation that the SOD's yellow fruit served as the blueprint for what William Casey called the Enterprise. The Special Operations Division and Yellow Fruit had a unique access to equipment, material, offshore bank accounts, a secret clandestine uh, army slash CIA aviation unit, a clandestine ship overseas to provide transportation, uh, access to material and weapons, all the seeds that would later basically erupt in the Iran-Contra affair and be known as the Enterprise. And I believe that Yellow Fruit and the Special Operations Division were both being groomed by the CIA and the National Security Council to serve as the cornerstone of the enterprise to perform operations in Central America and elsewhere that would never be accounted to Congress. The Pentagon shut down its enterprise while still in its embryonic form. But William Casey and Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North set about creating it again not only were there Contras to support in Central America, there were hostages to be freed in the Middle East, including one of the CIA's own, kidnapped Beirut Station Chief William Buckley. Casey, determined to get Buckley back, tried a new approach, bribery. Casey was in a mode at that point uh, in the spring of 1985 when he said, bribery stops terrorism. The car bombings were the number one, really the, the primary terrorist problem. The second one was the hostages. So they decided, let's bribe the hostages back. Who has influence over the people who hold the hostages Iran? What do they want? Money? No. Food, medicine, scholarships? No. Arms? Yes. Thus, the Iran arms sales. First word of the secret Iran arms sales came from a Lebanese publication in November 1986. Ronald Reagan, in an address to the nation, denied the report. The charge has been made that the United States has shipped weapons to Iran as ransom payment for the release of American hostages in Lebanon. That the United States undercut its allies and secretly violated American policy against trafficking with terrorists. Those charges are utterly false. But less than two weeks later, U.S. Attorney General Edwin Meese made a startling announcement. Certain monies which were received in the transaction were uh, taken and made available to the forces in Central America which are opposing the Sandinista government there. This announcement set off a major congressional investigation what has become known as Iran-Contra. Colonel North, please rise. More than any other witness, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North has come to represent America's continuing dilemmas between secrecy and democracy. Nothing but the truth, so help you God, I do. Please be sure. Through the hearings, it became clear that after Congress had shut off support for the Contras, Reagan had turned to his national security staff to find other help. That request changed the mission of the NSC from an advisory council into an operational group, 
not unlike a mini CIA. It was a gung-ho assignment given to a can-do Marine. This lieutenant colonel is not going to challenge a decision of the commander-in-chief for whom I still work. And I am proud to work for that commander-in-chief. And if the commander-in-chief tells this lieutenant colonel to go stand in the corner and sit on his head, I will do so. North, with the collaboration of National Security Advisors Robert McFarlane and later Admiral John Poindexter, first raised funds from other countries and private individuals to support the Contras. I told him that I was interested in, um, uh, in seeing what I could do, and I asked him for his recommendations. And did North, uh, subsequent to the meeting, provide you the Swiss bank account name and number to which your payment should be made? Yes, he did. With money in hand, this man, retired Air Force General Richard Secord, was recruited. Together, these three men set about creating Casey's dream of the Enterprise. A secret organization, accountable to no one, capable of carrying out covert operations anywhere around the world. The director was interested in the ability to go to an existing, as he put it, off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, stand-alone, self-financing entity, independent of appropriated monies, and capable of conducting uh, activities similar to the ones that we had conducted here. There were other countries that were suggested that might be the the beneficiaries of that kind of support, other activities. You understood that the CIA is funded by the United States government, correct? That is correct. You understood that the United States government put certain limitations on what the CIA could do, correct? That is correct. And I ask you today, to all you've gone through, are you not shocked that the director of Central Intelligence is proposing to you the creation of a organization to do these kinds of things outside of his own organization? Counsel, I can tell you I'm not shocked. I don't, I don't see that it was necessarily inconsistent with the laws, regulations, uh, statutes, and all that obtain. Despite a White House policy of making no concessions to terrorists, the Enterprise sold weapons to Iran in the hopes of gaining the release of American hostages. Weapons which the Iranians would use in their war with Iraq. The profits from these sales were diverted to fund the Contra War against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. that idea of using the Ayatollah Khomeini's money to support the Nicaraguan freedom fighters as a good one. I still do. I don't think it was wrong. I think it was a neat idea. And I came back and I advocated that and we did it. There is nothing more to fear for a democracy than the scheme Casey called the Enterprise. It amassed its own airplanes, pilots, airfields, navy, communications network, and secret bank accounts. It was answerable to no one, and known but to a handful of men. Men who had decided they alone knew what was best for America. Self-sustaining, lacking restrictions or accountability, the Enterprise's very existence was a subversion of the Constitution of the United States. It is an elitist vision of government that trusts no one not the people, not the Congress, and not the cabinet. It is a vision of a government operated by persons con convinced they have a monopoly on truth. But the truth was not what Congress had been told months prior when it had suspected inappropriate actions on the part of the NSC. I participated in the preparation of documents for the Congress that were erroneous, misleading, evasive, and wrong. 
I misled the Congress. I mis at that meeting. At that meeting. Face to face. Face to face. You made false statements to them about your activities in support of the Contras. I did. To many observers, though, the Congressional Oversight Committees seemed all too willing to allow themselves to be deceived. I don't think they really take on the intelligence community in any serious sense. I'll give you an example. I did a story in July of 86 for the New York Times about the fact that the NSA is, was working together with the British, its British equivalent, the GCHQ, um, and they were together working uh, to collect information on the African National Congress and its travels outside of Southern Africa, and we relay, relaying that to the South Africans with whom we have a liaison. <coughs> so in secret, the committee has a hearing. In great secrecy, they bring in some top people who say no, there's nothing to it, end of investigation. I mean, I wouldn't report a story that way. I just wouldn't, you know. I mean, if that's how they do it, and that's the only experience I have firsthand, I've, I've heard that that's a normal experience. You know, that's not, that's not the way to run it. If you're supposed to be oversight, you're supposed to develop independent contacts, independent, have an independent ability to reach in. And they don't. They get in trouble, they have to write a letter to Mama and say, come in and tell me what you got, Mama. And that doesn't make sense. They can't be afraid to learn what's happening. They cannot be afraid of knowledge. And some people are afraid of knowledge because if you have knowledge, then you have to act. And so uh, it's sometimes more comfortable to not know. And I think there was a degree of that, in my view, during the Iran-Contra affair. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that members of the committee that I represented, the Senate committee, were prepared to say quite bluntly and directly that they felt that Congress did not do as, an effective, as effective a job as it should have. That doesn't excuse the lying, doesn't condone the shredding of documents, but Congress has to be more energetic. There has been much criticism of the Iran-Contra hearings themselves for being too narrow in focus, too hastily prepared, and too quickly concluded. What other activities had been undertaken? Had drugs been sold to support the Contras? What had been the role of Ronald Reagan or his vice president, George Bush? The answers to such questions may never be known, for much of the evidence of the enterprise was destroyed or shredded. Correct. And you were aware, were you not, sometime during the day on Friday, November 21st, that the Attorney General's people were going to come in and look at documents over the weekend? That is correct. And you shredded documents before they got there? I would prefer to say that I shredded documents that day like I did on all other days, but perhaps with increased intensity. That is correct. So that the people you were keeping these documents from the ones that you shredded, were representatives of the Attorney General of the United States. Well, they work for him. William Casey, the architect of the Enterprise, was never to testify. He died of a brain tumor in 1987, as the hearings were being held. If there's a tragic part to Casey, and I guess there is, it is that he ultimately didn't realize what this country is about, that we are different, that yes, we will have an intelligence agency, yes, we will do things in secret, but those uh, nation-defining activities like war can't be done in secret, that we can't go out and try to get the Saudi intelligence service to kill people we don't like. Because in America, we don't do that in secret. Because that tells the world who we are. It tells us who we are. With the destruction of evidence by North and Poindexter, and the death of William Casey, all of the facts of Iran-Contra may never be known. But this much is clear. In Iran-Contra, administration officials, believing they alone knew what was best, conducted secret foreign policy in violation of congressional laws. 
But Iran-Contra is only the latest episode in a continuing struggle between American democracy and the secret intelligence empire it has created. A disdain for the law, impatience for results, and a conviction that it can't be wrong if nobody knows. These were the mark of the CIA's disaster at the Bay of Pigs, the FBI's long history of illegal surveillance of American dissidents, and the National Security Agency's unauthorized monitoring of private communications. Who is there to protect us from America's secret warriors? Who will watch the watchers? number of ethical questions raised in these shows. We'll learn about ethics in America from the point of view of some judges, columnists, and politicians, and whether and how to defend a killer on ethics in America next. And I'll be followed by fighting ministers about people in Pittsburgh who took on the steel companies when they wanted to shut down the factories and invest in lucrative foreign firms. That'll be at 11 o'clock tonight. Well, tonight's final chapter of Secret Intelligence, at least so far, will be shown again Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Tomorrow evening, we continue with Between the Wars. Eric Severides is...